So it's a it's a short wrap up and farewell basically, um, and I think it has been super interesting last two days. And um, to start with, um, I just want to remind us it's now more than forty years that I think the, the modern type of brain stimulation was um, basically started first with with electric stimulation. Um, as you see here, it, um, it was stimulation of the motor cortex, and it never really uh, became very mainstream, which might also have to do with the fact that, well, you use uh, capacitance, which is charged to 1,500 volts, and then apply this voltage to the skin, uh, which obviously hurts a bit. Um, but you need that in order to, to get in uh, strong enough fields in the brain to then have a muscle twitch. But that was the start, and then these guys came and um, basically said, okay, we can, we have to do it better. And that was actually the, the start of, of brain stimulation, um, of magnetic brain stimulation. So now what I, I thought I'd do now for the, um, uh, for the last few minutes here is that I try to do some kind of mini medley of what has been presented the last two days. For, so basically one slide for each of the speakers. I, for that, I have to apologize right in the beginning, because first of all, I made my selection of what I thought might be interesting, and that might be obviously not what the speaker thought is the most interesting thing. And the second thing I have to apologize for is simply the, the um, screenshots of the speaker faces, because uh, I mean, when you're talking, you have a lot of facial activities going on. I tried to go do good screenshots, but uh, the facial expressions are sometimes just as they are when, when you just speak and then take a screenshot. So for those two things, I apologize. And with that, I want to start. So basically, I think one, one topic or one, one, yeah, one stream of this, this um, workshop was really to, towards the mechanistic understanding of brain stimulation effects um, with very basic research from, for example, from Alia Benali from Tübingen, just looking at, okay, how does actually on the single cell level on an invasive level, uh, stimulation um, of a single team S pulse look like, and how variable this across brain areas and, and so on. Um, this is actually extremely important information um, in order to then go to, to higher level um, effects of TMS later on, also to human effects. Um, also, I would also sort the talk from Matthew Krause a little bit in this direction, uh, basically saying, yes, with TACS, what you can do there is actually you can align the, the spike timing of, of the neurons a bit. And actually, it's quite uh, working quite well as long as you're in rest. Um, but actually, then when you um, try to mo modulate an ongoing oscillation, it becomes more complex. But he was a little bit hopeful that and also showed very nice evidence. Um, that also then you can start um, making sense out of these effects. So that's, that was quite nice. Um, in a similar way, very nice uh, from Andreas Vlachos, um, again, working towards a more mechanistic understanding of what we do, but now actually for plasticity effects of, of um, brain stimulation, where he nicely showed that what he saw in experiments, now we, um, we can start um, replicating also with models. And obviously, these models, I think, um, maybe already uh, still a little bit simplified because you look at a sim single um, neuron. And obviously, when you then talk about plasticity effects in, in, the, in the brain, you will have interaction. But it's a great starting point, and the, and the results are really encouraging. So that's, that was really nice also to see. Um, then Gellert uh, Pellet came in and said, yeah, well, um, that's, that's quite nice, actually. But in a way, um, in order to get really stable effects, um, and that's that's really important. Actually, you have to stimulate for several days. Yeah, so to get a therapeutic effect, which which is therapeutically meaningful, you have to stimulate for several days, and um, that obviously again or shows nicely the gap between an understanding what happens on a single neuron level plasticity to a therapeutic effect. I think it's a long way, but um, with the animal models and and the neural modeling, I think we are, we are actually, um, it, it's the right direction to go, absolutely. She also showed quite nice um, work on genetic-based magnetic stimulation, which I cannot cover now further because of lack of time. Then um, Colin Hanlon came and said, well, yes, that's nice when you do it in, in animals, especially in anesthetized animals, you get relatively stable effects. That's also what she saw. 
um, and um, relatively replicate, replicatable effects of, of um, neuroplasticity inducing protocols. But actually, when you do it in humans, and that's probably what we all know very well, then it's much more variable. So that was a very nice study showing um, also the effects of different theta bird stimulation, whether there's a certain pattern in terms of that, whether 600 or 1,200 or 1,800 uh, pulses are uh, better on average. And you see that there's a quite huge variability in, in individuals. So in addition to the basic mechanisms, which you can probably well study in, in controlled animal studies, this is an additional study uh, challenge, which then comes on top of that. Gesa Hartwigsen, in a way, added to this, saying, well, stimulation effects in the brain is actually really brain network effects. And she showed very nicely also how to, how to use uh, dynamic causal mosaicing, for example, to, to make sense of that. But again, it adds another level of complexity, obviously, to understanding brain stimulation effects in, in humans. Uh, uh, also in animals, but uh, it's it's not enough to look at the single area. Even we have to understand that how brain simulation effects then occur in the network. Obviously, this this is even more complex. She also had, a, I think, this was really nice from a from a methodological point of view. Often, when you don't find a stimulation effect, it might actually just be the way you look at it. Um, so you know, there might be more sensitive ways of looking at, at the data than just looking at the mean reaction time, for example, that, that I found out quite, quite nice thing as well. Um, again, um, adding a little bit to the complexity, then um, from Doshia Lee, um, she basically wanted to see how much uh, white matter matters um, when you, um, so in, in to TBI patients, how much white matter really affects then the effects to brain stimulation and basically found that actually, at least in the design she used, uh, the brain state was the dominating factor and white matter was not so strong as, uh, as, uh, as relevant. So that is, that is bringing yet another level in. So what's the brain state? I think it's, it's a relatively complex, complex uh, con concept also because Brain state has very different time courses. You can talk about brain states on the minute or even hour level, maybe, but you can also talk about brain states which are very short, which was, for example, done by Tim Ole Bergman, who showed that, first of all, mu power um, affects the outcome of, um, of um, single pulse TMS, but also um, the um, phase. So basically, phase obviously of mu varies very quickly. And even that can have an effect on the TMS MEP amplitudes which you're getting. So I think brain state is, is a relatively complex um, concept, uh, which we might have to break down into, into more than one concept, basically. Then Christopher Masson um, made, I think, a few quite nice um, technical comments on, well, um, you can actually measure new phase quite reliable and still have actually no effect. So there's um, basically also effectors beyond the phase, uh, which are relevant parameters for the TMS MEPs. Um, and um, it's so make, adding again complexity to the story and also just highlighting that you have to be very, very, um, yeah, take care of detail when you do these kinds of studies. Um, these two studies, um, which I just highlighted, were done in the motor cortex, but obviously our goal is to go beyond the motor cortex, in particular when it's about neuromodulatory effects um, in, in patients where we want to stimulate, for example, some, something like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And obviously it would be really nice to be able to read out the excitability of the cortex also there and the immediate responses and uh, uh, Sarah Temple, Temple uh, gave a very nice, I think, overview of the potential of TMS EG, but also um, the um, methodological considerations which you have to take care about there. Robert Reinhardt um, then basically said, okay, what you can do instead of um, measuring the brain state or the state of a certain brain oscillation and align your stimulation to that, we can also do it the other way around. Actually, we can do, we can use um, brain stimulation, specifically TACS.
to then start um, inducing the coupling between these two areas and um, in all the subjects. And when you stimulate those both in phase in all the subjects, you could demonstrate a behavioral improvement, which I find really nice uh, because in many of the, or in some of the prior studies, having used the same concept, um, the condition which was working best was actually the anti-phase condition where these two currents were basically then out of phase and um, only those uh, had a clear behavioral effect and you know, this behavioral effect was then actually a decrease of performance not, not an increase of performance so this is actually quite nice to see that brain stimulation might really have an um, effect or in uh, um, this this way of brain stimulation might have the potential to also improve the behavioral effects This was then also followed up by Simon Hanselmeyer, who, um, well, I think would, I would say raised a um, word of caution saying, well, we can also have a non-finding, um, basically that um, even you do a very carefully designed study with a lot of subjects, you actually don't find an effect. The really nice thing in that study still was that the way he was analyzing the data with Bayesian statistics, really allowed him to prove that there was really no effect. So I think Bayesian statistic is something which, which we probably should all embrace to have a more clear understanding on, on how strong our effects really are and how reliable and whether we really have our effect also, also be able to prove a non-effect. And then again, modeling from Stephanie Jones um, to basically give us the opportunity to wrap that all together in, in a, whole brain model or at least a model of several brain areas um, where then we can study how um, basically oscillations might arise in, in, in such networks. I found it very nice. I also found very nice that um, she actually then said that, or very important that she said that, um, well, models will not solve your question or solve your problem. Uh, you, you really have, you should rather use them as a tool for, for example, plausibility testing of the hypothesis which you have, or also to fine tune your hypothesis. So models alone will not do the job, but um, they can really help you to, to gain additional understanding and, and sharpen your hypothesis, which you then can use to again have, have nice and sharper uh, experiments to confirm uh, the hypothesis or uh, exclude them. Um, this was from Thomas Knöschel, again, um, showing the different levels um, which come together when you just induce a simple finger, finger twitch. And actually what's, what's missing here, I would say, is actually also the spinal level, which also comes on top of that. So, so in a way, even the most simple way of using TMS um, involves quite a number of levels which we have to understand here, um, which he raised very, uh, I think, very elegantly here, before then coming to his, his mapping approach um, where he combines electric fields um, uh, with um, MP recordings uh, to hide, uh, to lock or to localize the position of the cortex, which is most likely stimulated. That shows that um, even when we don't have the full understanding, but we really stick to this very first level, actually, we can already make some practical useful tools with that. In a similar way was a talk from Ilka Laxo, who looked at dose effects of TDCS in humans and, and several very nice and comprehensive studies, um, basically demonstrating that you do see dose effects. So the electric field strength seems to matter. Um, for example, here for, uh, determines the uh, change of the MEP amplitude after TDCS. Um, the, the amount of change, inter-individual change or individual change is correlated um, with the, with the field, which I think is very encouraging because it means that the electric field, which is clearly a relatively crude marker of, of what, what you do to the neurons, might still be a an, an relevant, practically relevant um, tool to use. In a similar way, Daria Antonenko um, also showed that um, you, that you can demonstrate for TDCS here a link between electric fields and GABA changes in the motor cortex region, or also the electric field in prefrontal areas and behavioral effects. I'm pretty sure that there will be also non-findings coming out, um, but I think that's actually quite interesting to figure out uh, in which cases, which situations the um, 
the electric fields are predictive and in which cases not, and then try to uh, go further and try to understand why that is the case. And with that, I'd like to um, also in behalf of all of the two other organizers really thank for your particip active participation. And what I did not cover in this talk, which you might have noticed is that I didn't talk about the great posters and also the nice, very nice poster, poster presentations simply because of lack of time also for me pr to prepare this presentation. So thanks a lot for your very active um, particip participation and we hope to see you next year really uh, face to face in Minnesota in real, in real life again. Let's hope that this will then be possible again.